Very good. Thank you for that, Jordan. I'm going to, um, just thinking about Independence Day, I'm going to do a, a service today that is a little bit different. And here in just a little while, any young people who want to move up to the front, I'll move you up there. Uh, there's not going to be a junior church today. I've got a, a lesson today that I, uh, that I built for uh, the idea of being able to speak directly to young people. And I've got plenty of pictures. So there's a lot of pictures and the things to look at. Uh, and for the rest of us, I'm going to invite us uh, to join in and just to uh, kind of listen in on that, that uh, whole little lesson that I would like to do specifically for our kids. Uh, I believe we have a society that looks at the worst of people. And we've got a society that looks and we, we see men and women of the past, specifically our founding fathers, and we are able to look historically. I'm only 35 years old. But when I was a child, uh, I was taught different things. And I was taught that the American flag shouldn't touch the ground. I was taught there's a specific way to fold it. I was taught that there was a, a way to uh, look at our nation. And we looked at our, looked at our nation through a lens of, of goodness, a lens of patriotism. And we used to look at our country a certain way, and I believe that there's a lot of that uh, that is forgotten. There's a lot of that where... Uh, things are pushed the other way. And I look and I see in our nation, we see things that happen today that I never would have would have dreamed of seeing. And I remember we were putting these flags up, and it's kind of nice. Uh, we were putting these flags up. My girls were helping. We were unrolling them. And uh, my girls like to help with all kinds of different things. Uh, they want to get involved, and they want to do this stuff. And so, but they're little. And Kennedy, she was trying to unroll it, and she's not even taller than the flag. And as she's unrolling flags and getting them ready, I've got Jason and Cass here, and they keep saying, don't let it touch the ground. Don't let it touch the ground. That's the American flag. I'm thankful for that. And the idea of protecting what is, what is virtue, the idea of protecting something that is sacred. And I believe that a lot of those things are under fire. We know that to be true. I remember when we, uh, we began the discussion as a nation whether or not we should start removing statues. And Robert E. Lee was on the, the chopping block. And I remember watching this thing and, and uh, the justification of removing Robert E. Lee statues because it's racist and these different things. And, and I don't argue the faults that we have as a nation. I don't look into our past and, and uh, neglect to see the things that are our shortcomings. And I'll talk about that some uh, this morning. Uh, but we, we have left there and we have removed Robert E. Lee. We moved from there and also remove Grant. I mean, what in the world are we thinking? This is a guy who was fighting in direct opposition to Robert E. Lee. There's a complete departure from reason, departure from history, a departure from truth as a society. And I just want this morning to examine a few different things. I'm uh, going to read a Bible verse to begin, and I'm going to make sense a little bit of that Bible verse as we progress a little further. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 7, if you want to turn there, and then I'll, I'll leave the scripture for a moment and I'll come back to scripture uh, towards the end. But if you go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number seven and verse number uh, one, Matthew chapter seven and verse number one. Matthew chapter seven and verse number one, the Bible says, judge not. The Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what measure ye meet, uh, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam that is in thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. I believe we, we look back historically. And there are, there are people in the founding of our country. And we are, we are with the lens that we look back. We are, we are changing our perspective on some things. 
and we are going to a group of people and we were looking at their whole life that is documented because they're, they're in public eye. And so there are books that are written about these men. There's letters that are written to and from these men. There's, there's history that has recorded the lives of these men. And it seems now we have a society that when we, we look back on these men, what we are doing is we are combing through their life and we are finding the worst qualities. We are finding the worst quotes that they ever gave. We're finding the worst decisions that they ever made. We're finding the worst attitude that they ever had. We're finding the worst, the worst road they ever walked down. And we're writing, writing novels and books. And boy, we're, we're lifting all of that up and pulling the worst out of somebody. Every president of the United States, if you were to look at the worst decisions they made, and that's all you ever talk about, we've never had a good one. Not a single one. If we consider then ourselves, if I'm 35 years old, as a 35-year-old man, you could fill the pages with the mistakes that I've made. You could fill the pages with arrogance. You could fill the pages with unkindness. You could fill the pages with lies. You could fill the pages with theft. You could fill the pages with a meanness, with a self-centeredness. You could look at my life, and if your desire was to paint me in a bad light, you could be incredibly honest and successful all at the same time. You could do so. And I believe if you were to consider your own life and you were to take the worst of you, if the worst things about you were documented, if the worst thing you ever said was on paper, and then all of a sudden history was to look back at your life, you'd sure hope that they would want to take some time and say, surely they, they said something good also. Surely this wasn't every day. Surely this doesn't define them as a whole. I'm going to talk about David here at the end, uh, but I want to take a moment, and I believe when we look at our founding fathers, we're not looking at perfect men. We're looking at flawed men. We're looking at men who have done wrong, men who made bad choices, men who lacked character in several areas. But I also believe we look at founding fathers who had integrity, who had strength, who had determination, who sacrificed, who did all these things. That's what I want to talk about a little bit this morning, compare some thoughts to uh, some characters in the Bible. And then we will tie that up together with one final Bible verse this morning. Before I jump in, I want to read for us this morning the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, driving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whether any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect the safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will, in, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And, according, and accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when long train of abuses and usurpations are pursuing invariably the same object invents a de design to reduce them under absolute Despo de despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future safety. There were 56 men that signed this Declaration of Independence and they sent it off. Every one of them in signing it, they, they declared something. They declared their independence from their country that was oppressing them. The government that taxed them without representation. If you, you look at their list of demands and their, their list of uh, not demands, their, their list of accusations against their government. It was long. It was lengthy. It comes right after uh, this preamble that is here. But we look and we, we have 56 men that signed that Declaration of Independence. Every one of them earned for themselves a death penalty. Every one of them took their livelihood. They took their wealth. They took the security of their family. They took their own heads and they put them on the table and they said, we stand for this. We believe this to be true. 
We live in the greatest nation that this world has ever seen. We have such great freedom, such liberty. We've got every, everything that we could possibly want out of this world that God has created 6,000 years ago. Every possible good thing, and we've got it. We've got every single card in our hand. We hold all of them. There's not a single place in this world that has a better hand to lay down on the table. We've got the best, all of it. There's nothing we lack. And we have it because 56 men, July 4th, 1776, took out a pen, wrote their name on this, and sentenced themselves to treason. And they were willing to do so because their kids could then have an opportunity to have what we have, and their grandkids, and their grandkids' grandkids. And that's what we have. I got to go down to my Aunt Betty's funeral uh, this past Monday. While I was there, got to go to the cemetery where, where all these people are buried. I got uh, generations down there in this cemetery. I was there, and you can go to the Sweelys. And the Sweelys woke up one morning in Germany and uh, decided this is our last day in Germany. Uh, they came over here to the United States, and when they got here, uh, they had a little girl named Frances. And she was born here and. Uh, that would be my grandfather's mother. There was also another couple, and they were the Jorgensons, and they woke up one day in Denmark, and uh, that was the last day they woke up there. They got on a boat, and they came over here, and uh, they already had a couple kids. But when they got here, they had another boy that was born here in America. His name was Andrew. And Andrew grew up, and he was the, the son of immigrants from Denmark because they woke up in Denmark and said, we want to be... In America. And then Andrew was born here as an American. Andrew grew up and uh, he went and he found this lady named Frances and she was born from Germany to the Sweelys. When they got married, uh, all of a sudden they started having kids. And one of those kids, his name was Ronald. Ron. And Ron, I believe his middle name was Frank after his mother, Ron Frank. And uh, that was my grandpa. My favorite person in all the world. My grandfather. And then he had some kids, one of them sitting right there, another one sitting over there. And uh, he had some kids, and one of them is standing here. When they came to America, they went down and they were in the Yankton area. And both the German side and the Danish side, they, they settled right there in South Dakota. And they had a son in South Dakota named Andrew, who had a son in South Dakota named Ron, who had a son in South Dakota named Ron, who had a son in South Dakota named this guy. This is my country. This is my home. This is where I'm from. I'm not from Germany. I'm from America. I'm not from Denmark. I'm, I'm from America. This is where I was born. I was born in the greatest place in all the world. And the only reason it is here is because of these guys. These guys. I'm going to talk about them in a moment. And right before I do, young people, if you want to come down to the front, I want to show you some pictures. So if you want to take these, these couple pews right here, you're welcome to join. If you'd rather sit by your mom or your dad, you're welcome to. Uh, but if you want a better angle at some pictures, you want to come down here, you're more than welcome. I won't yell at you the whole time. But if you want to come down, I've got something that I'd like to give to um, every family that is here. This is the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. And so, um, Jason, you want to hand those out? Everybody here, just one for every family. I think I've got enough for every family. But that's the Constitution of the United States. If there were some politicians here, I'd like to give them some constitutions. But let's see how that goes. All right. We'll give Jason just a little moment to, to get around here. All right. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures. Now, these pictures are not perfect people. These pictures are not sinless people. There's only been one. What was the one sinless person's name? Yes, right here. Jesus. Jesus. The greatest king that we've ever had was King David. And one day, Jesus, the only perfect person, is going to come to this world, and he's going to establish his throne on the throne of David. David was not a perfect king. David was not a perfect man. There's times in David's life where you wouldn't even call him a good man. There's days in David's life where I, I can look back at his life and I can read about it where he murdered a good friend of his to cover up 
The idea of an inappropriate relationship, not a good situation. If you want to emphasize the bad, you can emphasize the bad. And when I look and I see in Scripture, uh, you've got David, who is a man after God's own heart, which we will see in the book of Acts if I turn to it at the end. What's interesting to me is if you ask kids to fill in the blank, you just have a, a blank, and you're going through Bible stories, and you say, David and blank. Kids will say, David and Goliath. David and Goliath. You go to adults, we're significantly more cynical. Can't compete with David and Goliath. I can't do that. But boy, David and Bathsheba, now that's more like it. We get to be a whole lot more cynical. And our society does that. We want to look back on certain people and we, we look at the worst of them rather than the best. So this morning, I don't want to paint uh, these guys as perfect holy people. But I do, I do want to remind us of a side to these guys that I believe should not be swallowed up with the negative that is also there. Any more than I want you to look back at my life and find some loser that's never done anything good in his life and was always unkind and always bad and never did anything right. I want you to be able to examine from both sides and judge me fairly as a man. And when we look back and we judge these people, just like in Matthew chapter number 7, we ought to judge them the way we would like to be judged. And I want to be judged with both hands. Tell the story of the bad stuff, but try to balance that out at least a little bit. And that's what I want to do this morning, because I think sometimes we forget some of these things when we think about these men. This guy here, this is John Hancock. How many of you ever heard of John Hancock? Yeah, some of you, and uh, both my kids. You guys are just sucking up. You just, I just read so much. Here we have John Hancock. John Hancock was the first signer of the Declaration of Independence. And when you think about being the first to do something, if you ever go, and I remember going swimming all the time in the Trestle and Del Rapids, and every now and then there'd be, there'd be logs under there. You can't see them because they'd be floating underneath the water. So somebody always had to be the first one to jump. And the first one to jump, you don't know how deep the water's going to be because it'd go up and down, and you're jumping off the, the train tracks into the water long ways. It's always a little scary to be the first one. And then after somebody jumps in and they don't die, you go, okay, let's all jump in. It's really easy. This guy right here, remember we taught 56 guys. He's the first one to sign it. And when he signed that piece of paper, if he was the only one, that's treason. And if there's 56, it's still treason. But he's the first one to jump. I want us to think about some things that he had to say. As you look at his picture, this is John Hancock. Resistance to tyranny becomes the Christian and social duty of each individual. Continue steadfast and with a proper sense of your dependence on God, nobly defend those rights which heaven gave and no man ought to take from us. That's a John Hancock quote. Here's a man who was not perfect. Here's a man who didn't do everything like he was supposed to, who didn't do everything just right. But here's a guy who knew God and talked about God. That's John Hancock. We wouldn't be here today if we didn't have the person who signed the Declaration of Independence first. And that's that guy. This guy right here. This guy is Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams was the signer of the Declaration of Independence. He's also called the father of the American Revolution. You can look at him, and uh, I don't know if you think he looks like a nice guy or what he looks like. All these guys, my kids say, none of them look happy. Well, nowadays when you get your picture taken, everybody says, smile. But back here when they're painting, imagine trying to smile for three hours. They try to do that. So everybody's more somber looking. Just sit there and relax. And so these guys just relax. So when you go get a picture, nobody says, hey, relax. We can take a picture. They say, hey, smile. But that was a little different back here. But let's hear what Samuel Adams had to say. And as it is our duty to extend our wishes to the happiness of the great family of man, I, con I conceive that we cannot better express ourselves than by humbly supplicating to the supreme ruler of the world that the rod of tyrants may be broken to pieces and the oppressed may be made free again, that wars may cease in all the earth and that the confusions that are and have been among nations may be overturned by promoting and speedily bringing on that holy and happy period. Now think about this. Listen. You guys listen to this? This is his prayer. The speedily bringing in 
of that holy and happy period when the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may be everywhere established and all people everywhere willingly bow to the scepter of him who is the Prince of Peace. Is this a perfect guy? No, he's not a perfect guy. Is he a guy that was willing to take his neck, stick it on the chopping block and say, I'm willing to die so that you can be free, so that I can be free, so I can live in a country that is better than any other, a country that is surpassing all others in the liberty and the freedom and the, the pursuit of happiness that I get. This guy willing to sign his name and talk about Christ. This guy here, another signer of the Declaration of Independence. And this guy did something a little more than that. He was also one of the ratifiers of the Constitution. When we consider this right here, this Declaration of Independence, he signed it. This Constitution, he ratified it. He was one of the people that made it official, brought it into uh, fruition, made it what it is. And he signed both of those. This Constitution is what gives us the freedoms that we have. That's our rights. We look, this is what Benjamin Rush had to say. The gospel of Jesus Christ prescribes the wisest rules for just conduct in every situation of life. Happy they who are enabled to obey them in all situations. Sounds like he was a fan of Jesus. Is he a perfect person? No, because there's only one perfect person. We look on. If morals, precepts alone could have reformed mankind, the mission of the Son of God in all the world would have been unnecessary. The perfect morality of the gospel rests upon the doctrine which, though often controverted, has never been refuted. I mean the vicarious life and death of the Son of God. This man, look at his face. This guy put his name on a piece of paper. He put his life on the line so that we could be free. And this man talks about the goodness of Christ. This guy, you probably recognize because he's on some money. And he's on the money everybody wants. What's his name? Benjamin Franklin. Very good. That's why people say I got to get me some Benjamins and uh, stuff like that. Anyway, Benjamin Franklin, uh, was he a perfect guy? No. But Benjamin Franklin was a signer of the Declaration and of the United States Constitution, just like Benjamin Rush we just saw. Here is my creed. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe, He that he governs it by providence, that he ought to be worshipped. As to Jesus of Nazareth, my opinion of whom you particularly desire, I think the system of morals and his religion, as he left them to us, is the best the world ever saw or is likely to see. The people who are able to look down the road and see me as a free American citizen, as a a partaker in these liberties was a man who also acknowledged Jesus Christ. Here's another guy. I always thought this guy looked a little nicer. My wife, anytime she sees a, an actor on TV, even if he's a bad guy, she always says, he seems like he's really a nice guy, uh, just by looking at, it, at the face. But here's Alexander Hamilton. He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a ratifier of the U.S. Constitution. Another man who wrote his name on a piece of paper that earned for him death from his government. And he's willing to do it so that you and I can be free. He made this statement. I have carefully examined the evidence of the Christian religion. And if I was sitting as a juror upon the authenticity, I would unhesitantly give my verdict in its favor. That's Alexander Hamilton. He said many other things. Now, this is one, especially if you live in South Dakota, you should recognize this guy because his head is as big as this church. What's, who's this guy? Yes, George Washington. George Washington, he went and he, he fought battles. He picked up a rifle. He jumped on a horse. He ran into battle. He did a lot of different things. When he wanted to fight for freedom, he was the one that ran towards the shots. Now, I remember just yesterday, I've got kids that are small enough. When the fireworks go off, they want to run the other way. This guy, when the cannons were going off, when there was the yelling and the sound of battle and guns were being fired, he grabbed his gun and he ran towards it because he knew that there was a fight that was worth fighting and he was fighting for my freedom. He was fighting for your freedom. George Washington one time said this, while we are zealously performing the duties of good citizens and soldiers, we certainly ought not to be inattentive to our higher duties of religion. 
to the distinguished character of patriot, it should be added, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. That was George Washington. He was our first president of the United States. Let's take a look at the second president of the United States. This guy right here. This is John Adams, the second president of the United States, also a signer of the Declaration of Independence. John Adams, he made the statement, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by their precepts they're exhibited. Every member should be obligated in conscience to temperance, frugality, and industry, to justice, kindness, and charity toward his fellow men, and to piety, love, and reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be? That's from his diary. He wrote that in a diary just, just for himself. He was just musing on that. He was just laying in his bed one night and he wrote that down because that's what was going through his mind as the second president of the United States. Just saying, boy, I wish everybody had the Bible. If everybody had the Bible and obeyed it, this world would be a perfect place. And it would be. That guy, the second president and a signer of our Declaration of Independence, willing to die so you can be free, so I can be free. He went on, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the only principles in which that beautiful assembly of young gentlemen could unite. And these principles only could be un intended by them in their address or by me in my answer. And what were these general principles I answered? The general principles of Christianity in which all these sects were united and the general principles and English, of English and American liberty. He went on. I won't read the last part there for you because that's a little bit harder to follow. Uh, but here we have the third president of the United States. Does anybody know the name of the third president of the United States? Yes. Mm, no. Yeah, give it, give, it just, give it just a moment. Here's Madison. It's all about Madison. But anyway, uh, this is the third president of the United States. This is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States, the drafter. So not only did he sign the Declaration of Independence, what we just read out of the preamble of the uh, Declaration of Independence, he's a drafter of that, a drafter and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. This is Thomas Jefferson, who was not a perfect person. And if you wanted to examine his whole life and you were to pull out all the bad things that he did, all the dumb stuff he said, boy, you could have a lot, just like you could with any single one of us. But Je Thomas Jefferson also said this, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed them only firm, uh, removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated with, uh, but, his, but by his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Thomas Jefferson also said, I am a real Christian, that is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. How about you come sit over here? There we go. Thank you. Now don't bug her. <laughs> there we go. That's Thomas Jefferson. Perfect man? No. Did he have faults? Yes. Did he make incredibly bad choices? Yes. Was he always kind? No. But there's also a second side to Thomas Jefferson that we need to keep in our minds. He was the drafter of the Declaration of Independence and a signer of it. He put his name on a piece of paper that signed his death warrant from his government so that you and I can be free. And he made those statements. This one here. Who do you think this one is? Who is that? Madison. Madison. James Madison is the fourth president of the United States. James Madison... He makes this statement, a watchful eye must be kept on ourselves, lest while we are building ideal monuments of renown and bliss here, we neglect to have our names enrolled in the annuals of heaven. He wanted us to think about some things. Hey, are you a citizen here? How about are you a citizen there? He wanted that to be in our minds. That's our fourth president of the United States. Concern for the salvation of his people. Boy, you're a citizen here? What about glory? As a statement that he had made. This guy here. This guy, John Quincy Adams, the sixth 
President of the United States. Here we go. The hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Whoever believes in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures must hope that the religion of Jesus shall prevail throughout the earth. Never since the foundation of the world have the prospects of mankind been more encouraged to that hope than they appear to be at this present time. And may the associated distribution of the Bible proceed and prosper to the Lord shall have made, listen to this, because he's going to quote from the book of Isaiah here, have made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This is the sixth president of the United States. He sounds like a pastor that wants to send missionaries to the world. He sounds like a man who says, you know, we, we got to get Bibles to every nation so we can fulfill what the book of Isaiah said about how God's arm is going to prevail and go to the ends of the world. That's our sixth president, a man who is willing to stand up and to say some nice things about Christ. This guy here, he's a big one. This is Patrick Henry. Does anybody know something that Patrick Henry had said? You look like you want to raise your hand back there. No, just right here. Something Patrick Henry said. Yes. Give me liberty or give me death. That was Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry, a few hundred years ago, was willing to stand up. Looking at the, the future of our country, looking at the idea of declaring independence and being, bringing freedom to the people that are here. Patrick Henry said, I'm going to be willing to die for this. He says, give me my freedom, give me my liberty, or give me death. He says, I will not live like this. I'm going to fight for freedom, and he fought for it, and we won our freedom. Because men were willing to stand up and say, give me liberty, or give me death. This man also, he made these statements. He says, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom to worship here. We look and we, we see these men, they were doing what was right for this country. They established for our country the very first amendment to our constitution. That first amendment gives us the freedom of religion. And it's so gracious that they are Christian people. Christian people who say, I'm going to establish a Christian nation. We're going to talk about the gospel of Christ. But anybody who wants to come in and believe different, you are welcome. If you want to come in and worship somebody else, you're welcome. I mean, think about that. They were not tyrants dictating to others the faith that they were required to have. They were not tyrants dictating to others the thought that they were allowed to have. They weren't trying to tell you what to think, what to believe, none of those things. They fought, they died, they lived so that we could have the freedom to do what we believe to be right. That's Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry also made this statement. He says, the Bible is a book worth more than all the other books that were ever printed. That's Patrick Henry. I'm almost done. Some of your attention is so good, you're staring at all of these, and then I can see some of you are starting to wane. And uh, I recognize time. Here we go, William Penn. Does anybody, if you could think about William Penn, not Madison, because she seems to have all the answers. Somebody else. Penn founded a state. What state do you think William Penn founded? True. What's that? What did you say? <laughs> I didn't hear what it was. Anybody? Yes, Matthew. Pennsylvania. Yes, very good. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. I want you to think about this. Pennsylvania, we have our capital was there. It was a big state, and, and a lot happened in the state of Pennsylvania. This guy started it, and I want you to look at that. That wasn't taken on an iPhone 6, I'll tell you that. Now, look at that picture. It's the best one I could possibly find of this guy when I printed it out. Here we go. He made this statement. I do declare to the whole world that we believe the scriptures to contain a declaration of the mind and will of God in and to those ages in which they were written, being given forth by the Holy Ghost, moving in the hearts of holy men of God, that they ought also to be read, believed, and fulfilled in our day, being used for reproof and instruction, that the man of God may be perfect. It's a paraphrase of a verse that the Apostle Paul gave us in the book of Timothy. This is a guy who knew his Bible because he's quoting it. He goes on. 
They are a declaration and testimony of heavenly things themselves. And as such, we carry a high respect for them. We respect them and accept them as the words of God himself. This is the founder of Pennsylvania who said this right here and everything in it. Those are God's words. It's quite the statement. It's quite the statement. Let's go. I've got just one more. One more, just because we talked about presidents in the executive branch. We talked about Congress and those who were drafting and signing the uh, Declaration of Independence along with the Constitution. This man right here, he is the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. The first chief justice. So we look and we've got the executive branch. We've got the legislative branch. We've got the judicial branch. We've seen from the first two. Here we've got our first Supreme Court justice, our chief justice here. This is John Jay. He was also the president of the American Bible Society. He makes this statement, By conveying the Bible to people thus circumstanced, we certainly do them a most interesting kindness. We thereby enable them to learn that man was originally created in place in a state of happiness, but becoming disobedient was subjected to the degradation of evils which he and his prosperity have since experienced. It's talking about the sin nature of man. It's talking about the value of the Word of God because it teaches us those things. The Bible will also inform that our gracious Creator has provided for us a Redeemer in whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, that this Redeemer has made an atonement for the sins of the whole world. This is a guy who knew his Bible. If you knew your Bible, you would recognize that every other thing that he's saying is a, a quote from the Word of God. So this guy knew his Bible. Redeeming, uh, this man was a redeemer, has made atonement for the sins of the whole world, and thereby reconciling the divine justice with the divine mercy has opened a way for our redemption and salvation, and that these inestimable benefits are of the free gift of the grace of God, not of our deserving, nor in our power to deserve. That sounds a lot like Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This man right here, John Jay, the first chief justice of our Supreme Court. That's a big position. That's a big man right there. Was he perfect? No, not a perfect man. You think he ever told a lie? He probably did. Maybe he stole something. Maybe he made some bad choices. There was a lot that was going on in our world at that time that is not right. And I'll talk about that just briefly here in a moment. One last thing that he said, informing and settling my belief relative to the doctrines of Christianity, I adopted no articles from creeds, but such as only on careful examination, I found to be confirmed by the Bible. This is the man, the first chief justice in our country. He was a Supreme Court judge. And he says, I want to look for right and wrong. I find right and wrong nowhere else. Nowhere else except in the Bible. That's that man. Now, if you want, you can stay right where you're at or you can go sit with your parents if you would like to do that. But I'm going to switch gears just briefly. I know my hour is already up and my time is already spent. But I want to take just a moment. And I want to read a couple different verses. Just two. Just two verses really fast. And I want to talk about them Really simply, we look in David's life. There was a whole lot of bad in David's life. We see David in chapter number 17 of 1 Samuel. We see him go kill Goliath. Big days. And we look and we see in chapter number 18, he, he's this, this great guy. And he just gets elevated and elevated and elevated. And the women are doing parades. And I imagine, I always wanted women to parade in the street for me. Uh... But there's just one, there's just one that thinks I'm that awesome. But, um, but imagine having a parade of women walking down the street, singing your praises. David also had some bad days. David had some days in his life where if you were to look and examine that, you'd say, what in the world? God was looking for a man after his own heart. God was looking for somebody to establish as the greatest king. In all of human history. And God did it with David. Was David a perfect man? No. No. David killed Uriah with the sword. That's a quote from the Bible. He covered it up. There's conspiracy. 
There was lies. There was adultery. There was murder. That's David. David made other mistakes in numbering the people. David made other mistakes in the word of God that's recorded. Now let's look. God is able to look. He sees all the good. He sees all the bad. And God never looks back and says, David was a perfect man. David never made mistakes. God doesn't look back and say, David, boy, he is without sin. Never does that. But God in the New Testament, when David's life has already fully been written, fully lived, every documentation on David has already been written. And God looks back at David and God says this, in spite of all the bad, God says this, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. It doesn't say that David never made a mistake. It doesn't ignore the fact that all through the Old Testament we see recorded the faults that he had. But God looking back and the conclusion is, man after my own heart. And I believe that we are in a dangerous spot when we look back and we see these guys. Because I can go through that list. Thomas Jefferson, I was reading about Thomas Jefferson. Boy, you can point out some things and you say, what, what in the world? That doesn't seem to match with some of the things that he said. That doesn't seem like that's right. Just like a man after God's own heart, I look and I say, well, what about Bathsheba? What about Uriah? I can point to the things. But God looks back and God says, boy, I used him for some good things. We look at Solomon, wisest man in the world. Wisest man in the world. And yet filled with a foolishness at the end. All the destruction that came because of his choices and the road that he took to go into idolatry. That was Solomon. We look at Saul. I look at Saul and I think the Apostle Paul. That's what I meant by Saul, not King Saul. But the Apostle Paul. I look at the Apostle Paul and I think, wow, greatest Christian. He murdered people. He murdered Christians. He picked up rocks and threw them at Christian people just for talking about Jesus. But we look in the Word of God. He's also the greatest Christian, I believe, who has ever lived, willing to die for the cause of Christ, go into all kinds of persecution to spread the gospel. The point is, is you will never find a perfect man. But if God can look at an imperfect man and be gracious and say, that was a good one, we ought to be able to look back to our history and if nothing else, take the bad and say, there's also this other side to it. Now, I didn't spend any time today giving you all the negative stuff. I didn't spend any time today talking about all the bad things. Because the world seems to be doing a really good job of that. I just want to take a moment to slow down and say, there's, there, are, there is another side. And not a single one of us would be here if they didn't do their job. You know who would not have moved to the United States from Germany if those guys didn't do what they did? The Sweelys. You know who went to move here from Denmark if those guys did not do what they would do? The Jorgensons. And I wouldn't be here. I look, I'm an American. I live in the greatest place in all the world to live. And I live here and I have those freedoms because men who were willing to sacrifice, sacrificed so that we can have what we've got. We've got these flags here. We've got a, a country where I believe patriotism and the idea of a love of country is sometimes feels like it's under fire. We have a nation where there is some black stuff in our history, some dark days. We've got things where we look and we see in our history, you scratch your head and you go, now wait a minute, how can good people do those things that doesn't match up? And it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't add up to any of those things. But we also live in a country that we fought for freedom. And then as a free nation, we fought the bloodiest war in all of American history in order to right that wrong. The idea of being able to look back and say, we can't be a good nation. Look where we came from. We were there and now we are not. Because thousands of people picked up a gun and said, we fought for our freedom. Now we are also going to fight for their freedom. 
That is sometimes forgotten. It's forgotten. We should not forget it. It's Independence Day yesterday. Independence Day weekend. We pick up the Word of God. We see God is gracious with history. We ought to be gracious with the good people and the good things that have been handed to us. Because if you gave me $100,000, a plane ticket to anywhere in the world, and citizenship anywhere else, I'd say, no, I'm good. I'll stay right where I'm at. You could offer me absolutely any other place. You could give me money to establish a home. You could give me a place for all my kids to go to school. And I'll say, you know what? Right here, this is, this is just fine for me. This is where I want to be. Because those guys, in spite of flaws, they fought for my freedom. And we ought to never forget it. I know I'm out of time. I don't need an invitation this morning. I encourage you to take these home. I learn a lot when I read that. It helps me to vote. It helps me to know what is right. It helps me be thankful for being an American. This morning, young people, regardless of what you hear about the founding fathers of our country, always try to balance that out, just as you would want them to balance it out for you. Some days you clean your room. Some days you don't. Some days you listen to your mom. Some days you don't. You'd hate for somebody to only look at you for your faults and ignore the good side. Let's go to a pray. We'll be dismissed this morning. And uh, we will try to get up to that lake as quick as we can. Uh, everybody is welcome. If you want to talk about baptism, if you want to do that today and jump in with the two we've already got, more than welcome. I'm already going to be wet. And so you're more than welcome to join us. I'm thankful for Independence Day. I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve in this church with the freedom I've got. Let's go ahead and we'll pray. We'll be dismissed. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to gather together. I thank you for uh, the men that came before us. Thank you for those who were willing to pick up a gun and to fight and to earn a freedom that was just given to me. It was just handed to me. Lord, I look at my life and I've never known hunger. I look at my life, I've never known oppression. I look at my life, I've never been owned. I look at my life and I've always been free. And Lord, I did nothing to earn it. It's just the grace of God that I was born here. Lord, help me to love my country as I ought to. Help me to hold stand, to hold to and to stand on truth. Lord, I thank you for your word, the difference it makes in the hearts and minds of people. I thank you for my country. I thank you for our independence. Lord, we love you. Bless our day in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed this morning. Yeah, I know. So I wish I would have loved it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.